one thing uh, that is burning question, uh, Professor Blight, for a lot of us, and it's a controversy on the internet, and that is, is it pronounced pew as in a church pew, Pulitzer Prize, or, yeah. pul or Pulitzer Prize? So people want to know, which one is it? I've heard it both ways, but at the Pulitzer Prize luncheon where they give you your award, it was called Pulitzer. So okay, I'll go good. With Pulitzer. All right, that's great. Well, people wanted to know, and so uh, that's great. Um, so I've heard different authors say that when they got the call, uh, they were quite shocked, surprised, and I guess that's a really appropriate thing to say because if you got the call and said, well, I was expecting you to call. I, you know, I was thinking it may be a little bit early, uh, <laughs> earlier than this. Uh, that might be a problem. But uh, I'm curious how you got the call and how you heard about it. Well, believe it or not, I had done my utmost to pay no attention. Uh, I, I, I knew from my agent and my editor that I was uh, somehow in the running but I never looked on the internet. Uh, I didn't even find out until the day that they actually live streamed the ceremony where they announced them. And I was just trying my utmost to pay no attention, trying to just stay calm. The truth is I was in a green room or a waiting room to give a talk in New York City. Uh, of all places, at Goldman Sachs, they have a... Wow. Uh, monthly uh, book talk for their staff and I was just waiting and about 15 minutes before I was supposed to go on um, uh, uh, the host or one of the hosts came running around the corner and said you won wow wow <laughs> that's how I found out that's awesome uh, then my you know my agent called my editor called uh, and so on I never did get a phone call from the Pulitzer Prize Committee uh, I think they just assume you're uh, your people let you know. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, congratulations. That's a huge honor. And thank you. You've written a lot of seminal books over the years, but that's got to be pretty exciting and thrilling to get that at this point in your career, especially after all that unbelievable work that so evidently went into your, your book. And if you need something to pad your resume or CV with, I just want you to know that you passed Moore's Law mm. of really good reading because what I do is when I read a book, I take the amount of pages read, which yours is almost 800, divide yeah. by two, which would be 400, of course. Mm -hmm. And if my marginality exceeds that number, then that's a worthwhile read. And I counted, oh. I was kind of curious. So the marginality I've got in your book is about 520. So congratulations. If you need something on your, your resume, you can just stick oh. it on there. Yeah, can you put that in writing for me? I mean, those sure, are numbers absolutely. that are hard to remember. I need, I need, to, I need to remember those numbers. That's useful. To me. I, can, I can go out there and pedal that. I think. Okay, well, good. Um, so, um, let's, let's thank you for having me. By the way. This oh gosh, well, my my pleasure. My privilege. Very nice you. You. I think me. he's on here, but I've got a friend who's actually uh, works at Yale and teaches part time there at the Institute uh, mm -hmm. for Sacred Music, and he oh. mentioned to me that he's been trying to connect with you for a while and he was kind of incredulous that I was able to get you on this zoom so I'm I'm really Tell me his name. I'll uh, I'll make sure I answer his email okay great right. I'll connect right. you guys that's great that's awesome Dave man you owe me a big favor there buddy hi right. professor Blake good to see you oh there hey. he is there he is right there you? well that's we have to connect here you're uh, you're probably uh, within one mile of me <laughs> yes that's great yeah. Um, so, uh, one last thing just by way of just clean up here, uh, Professor Blight, is that uh, one guy on here says that, and I'm curious about this myself, before we jump into your book, he heard one of your talks and he said, you sound a lot like Harrison Ford. So I'm curious if you've had that comment before. I've heard that many times. Uh, and. I've also heard Garrison Keillor a few times. I am from the upper Midwest. And okay. I guess I have Garrison Keillor tendencies too. But my answer on the Harrison Ford comparison is that I think I could beat him in a, in a running race. Oh, wow. In a jungle. Yeah. But, but that's about all I could beat him at. Okay, yeah. well, that's great. Um, so <laughs> tell us, um, so it's a massive undertaking uh, with this book. And 
I'm just kind of curious. I'm, I'm, we've got some writers on here as well. And I'm always, I've interviewed a couple hundred writers and scholars over the years. And I'm kind of curious about the way they corral the research, how they organize it. I know that James McPherson's talked about this, Gordon Wood and Alan Geslow, to give you a kind of a trifecta of historians. They all use the old analog, either five by eight cards or four by six cards, pretty <laughs> tedious. And all of them have confessed that they admit it's tedious. I think a couple of those use typewriters as well. So I'm curious how <laughs> you kept all this stuff together because it could get unbelievably unwieldy, I would think, an 800 page book. And you might have even cut out two or 300 pages. I don't know. but. My editor tried. <laughs> uh, I actually love this question, and you almost never get asked this, about the mechanics of how, how one works. I mean, I, I love that sort of problem. Uh, I started out my career with eight, eight by five index cards, I can assure you. I still have boxes of them, uh, many boxes of them. Um, that was in graduate school and then well into my career. Um, I no longer do research on those note cards. Uh, I tend to type into my laptop when I'm taking notes on sources, but I always print it out. I'm a, I'm a paper person. I have two entire file, uh, horizontal files full of uh, Frederick Douglass material. So I'm, uh, I, I tend to take notes, uh, hundreds of pages of notes, and then I print them out. Because then I can go into them with my, <laughs> my color-coded pens. Good for you, yeah. Something, in, something underlined in red has a certain meaning. Labeling in green has a certain meaning. And note-taking in blue or black has a certain <laughs> meaning. But uh, I'm not as organized as my, as my, stu my graduate students. Uh, I've never become uh, the kind of researcher that can just put everything on the laptop in multiple files. I just haven't graduated. I'm not a very good tech person, and I have never graduated to that level of just having everything at my fingertips on a laptop. I wish I had. Uh, my vertebrae would be better because I, I, I've traveled with bags of books and bags of paper all of my life. Um, including the year I spent, uh, I wrote eight chapters of this book on a fellowship at the University of Cambridge in England. Uh, I taught a little bit there, but I was mostly free to write, and I wrote a chapter a month. But I carted over there uh, all of my Douglas notes. Wow. And about 150 books. Turns out Cambridge University has a great library, and I didn't really need to take all of those books, but. Uh, you know, if you're a paper person and a book person, you, uh, you know, you end up with shoulder problems. But I can't graduate to uh, reading everything on the screen. I just can't do it. Okay. And I have a lot of other tricks about research, but uh, we all do. Yeah. So um, how did you decide, uh, I've heard you tell the story, some folks here might not have, and be curious kind of how you would tell it tonight, how you decided to take this on because you had to know, you've done other stuff on Douglas, you had to know, okay, I'm getting in, this is not a two year deal, this is not a three year deal. I'm kind of curious what you thought on the front end, because you were writing, you started this like in your late 50s, that you were something like 10, 12 years ago? Uh, yeah, almost uh, 13, 14 now. Okay. Um, I, I wrote another book along the way, uh, I think at least one, but, um, well, the truth is, I, I did my first book on Douglas, which was in graduate school, as my dissertation. It's a short, a relatively short book on the meaning of the Civil War in Douglas's life. I had then edited uh, editions of his first two autobiographies. I'd written essays on Douglas, et cetera, et cetera. And Douglas was some part of really virtually every other book I've ever done. <laughs> He's prominent in the index. Uh, but I had Douglas out of my life, done with Douglas. I was not going to attempt a full, full life of Douglas until about 14 years ago. I went to Savannah, Georgia. This is the story you've probably heard me tell, uh, David. Um, and 
I went there to give a talk to secondary teachers uh, about Douglas's uh, narrative, his first autobiography, which I've done many, many times. And while there, my host, which was the Georgia Historical Society, said there's a local gentleman here who is a collector and he'd like to go to lunch. And uh, that day, to make a long story short, I met Walter Evans, who uh, is an African-American uh, retired surgeon who lives in Savannah. He uh, grew up in segregated Savannah. He uh, came north for his higher education. Uh, Howard University as an undergraduate in DC, and then he went to the University of Michigan Medical School and then practiced as a general surgeon for nearly 35 years in Detroit. Mm. And I'm from Michigan. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, just up the road. So we immediately had a lot in common. But the thing about Walter is that he made a very good living as a surgeon, but his great passion in life was and still is collecting African-American art, uh, rare books, and manuscripts. And that day when I met him, he took me over to his house, which is a, a beautiful four-story brownstone in Savannah. If any of you are, have ever visited Savannah, you may even know the street. It's Jones Street, two blocks off Forsyth Park. And uh, Walter showed me portions of his Frederick Douglass manuscript collection, which were astonishing. Uh, it was one of those moments historians can rarely even dream of having. You are suddenly encountered with, with uh, material you didn't know existed. Mm. Now, What's so significant about that collection is that the core of it are some nine Douglas family scrapbooks that were kept by Douglas's, two of Douglas's three sons over the last 30 to 35 years of their father's life. They're enormous. They have thousands of newspaper clippings in them, mm -hmm. a lot of family letters, a lot of family documents, photographs, and that day I realized that this was a treasure, but it was not on first sight that I decided to do. I mean, I wish I could tell you that, you know, destiny struck me like the road to Damascus. Or That's not true at all. I took many months to figure out that I would take this on because this is daunting. This is a big life. It's a big epic life. And I had ideas and plans of doing other things, but, um, uh, it was in about 2006 or seven, I, I'm forgetting which year now, that I ran into that collection. Within the year, I made the commitment to write this new biography. Uh, my agent got involved. Once she, when she found out about this collection, she said, David, you're writing a new biography. And I would say, no, I'm not. She'd say, yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. <laughs> and she won that um, encounter. So that's how it came about. And the end of that story, or part of the end of that story, is that for years we've been trying to negotiate with Walter to, uh, to get his Douglas collection here to the Beinecke Library at Yale, which is one of the world's great uh, research and rare book libraries. And it took some years, but just as, as of this summer, uh, Walter finally took their offer. Um, he actually had an offer for the collection about five, six years ago. <laughs> but he didn't take it. Uh, he waited until after the book came out. <laughs> he's, he's a damn good businessman. Yeah. And he, uh, he negotiated a great price and the Beinecke now owns this, this extraordinary Douglas collection, which as we speak uh, down the street is being digitized. So the whole world can use it. They're almost finished digitizing it, I think. So that's why I decided to write this. Now, the key part of that collection, and anybody who looks at the book, if you look at the footnotes, you'll see, uh, for the last third of Douglas's life, this collection is crucial. Mm -hmm. And if, if Americans, or for that matter, anywhere else, know Douglas at all, they tend to know the young Douglas, the young heroic Douglas, the one who grew up as a slave for 20 years, escaped from slavery, became this famous orator. They may know something about him up to the time of the Civil War, 
But the aging Douglas, the last 30 years of his life, he lives till 1895. When he, when he moves to Washington, D.C., he becomes, a, to a certain extent, a political insider. He gets three federal appointments. The aging Douglas is what is so revealed in this Evans collection, and that's the Douglas we've never really known very well, and that collection made possible knowing Douglas and his family, I might say, much more deeply than we ever had before. It add, I will say, having read your book, that latter part adds uh, a poignancy that just telling the first half of his life, which is very compelling and amazing, but having the older Douglas, uh, his reflections on aging, his travels, his relationship with his second wife, etc., cetera, uh, mm -hmm. struggles financially in his, in his family, mm -hmm. all that stuff just adds a, a fullness to the life, which actually helps me pivot to my next question, which is, I think you do a terrific job, uh, you know this word well, hagiography, but a lot of folks maybe listening or some might not be familiar with it, that the word where a biographer will just tell the glowing mm -hmm. stuff about a person and yeah. paper over the, the darker stuff. It's clear from your book that you appreciate Douglas quite a bit, right. but it's far from hagiography. You definitely underscored some of his uh, blind spots, some of his foibles, some of his frankly, frankly, uh, kind of perennial feet of clay on certain issues. I'm curious mm -hmm. how difficult that was for you to navigate those kind of choppy waters at times. Were there times you were writing and kind of going, oh, I'm highlighting something a bit too dark. Was there any kind of, did you sense any kind of internal pull one way or the other while you're writing this as far as, am I getting this right? Is, is it really a, an accurate telling of his life? Oh, many times, many, many, many times. And it begins with the fact that Douglas is a great autobiographer, as many may know. He wrote three autobiographies through the course of his life, 1,200 pages of autobiography. And he is a master uh, of, uh, as a writer. Now, the problem with that is those autobiographies are the Douglas he wants us to have. And there are many, many, many aspects of his life that he simply does not write about in those autobiographies. This is not there. And that's especially the case with his family, his four adult children, uh, the death of his 11-year-old uh, daughter, Annie, in 1860, his two wives, Anna Murray Douglas of 44 years, a, a rich but very complex marriage uh, because Anna though born free, uh, remained a, a non-reader and writer all of her life. We don't know precisely why, but Anna was never really part of Douglas's public or intellectual life uh, in any open way. And then the second marriage to Helen Pitts, he's a little more open about that, but not much. And uh, in Douglas's 1,200 pages of autobiography, there is only one mention of Anna. Wow. And she's called my wife. Mm. I mean, it's painful. So you have to get at many elements of Douglas's life by other means and other sources and other kinds of correspondence and what people said of him. Then there were two relationships with European women. Uh, one, an English woman named Julia Griffiths, uh, who came to Rochester and in, up in New York in the late 1840s and stayed with the Douglases for six years. She played a crucial role in Douglas, in the survival of Douglas's newspaper, the survival even of Douglas's family. Uh, then later he had a 22 or 23 year friendship relationship with a German woman uh, who came to the United States named Otelia Ossing. He writes very, very little in these autobiographies. In fact, there's only one mention of Atelia Ossing in the autobiographies, the, the third autobiography, and she's called Miss Ossing and a friend of the family. Now, but it isn't just this, this you know, personal side of Douglas's life that caused his biographers lots of struggles. There's his personality, too. Uh, this is a brilliant man. This is a man who was a genius with language. 
This is a man who had an extraordinary charisma, uh, who was one of the greatest orators in all of American history. Uh, but he was also hypersensitive. He didn't make friendships very well, especially with men. He had a very hard time, especially in the young part of his adult life, trusting people. And you have to find ways to, to figure this out to an extent that you can explain it at least without uh, getting into you know, hyper uh, psychology. Douglas was 20 years a slave and he was an orphan. He never did figure out who his father was, but he knew his father was white and likely one of his two masters. His mother he hardly knew either, although he saw her last when he was six years old, but he, he barely could even remember her. So he knows he comes from the likelihood of the sexual abuse of his mother by one, by, well, by one of his two owners. He never did figure out who it might have been. It could have also been Aaron Anthony, one of Aaron Anthony's sons, uh, Douglas's first owner's sons. So there are many aspects of Douglas's personal life, his personality, that can cause you real struggles as a biographer. And then there are his blind spots. And I don't want to just dwell on these negatives because as you said, I came away after all these years again with Douglas, uh, greatly admiring him. Um, uh, he's just a master of words and we will always know him in his words. Uh, and I can say much more about that. But he also, you know, he. He said some pretty uh, ugly things about Native Americans. Uh, he was very fond of his Irish jokes, and they sometimes were, were not just jokes. Uh, he tended to love the Irish in Ireland, <laughs> but they loved him. It was the Irish in New York City that he <laughs> had trouble with. Uh, anyway, uh, and then there are other things. There, there are ways, that, that in certain ideological ways, that Douglas did late in his life uh, at times kind of fall out of touch with, with the next generation of leaders. But what typically happens, of course, in, in all times, is the next generation, particularly of black male leaders in the latter part of the 19th century, there were some very interesting younger men they were all freeborn, college educated, and they wanted to knock Douglas off. It's classic, you know, what, what, they wanted to knock off the so-called, you know, great man eloquent. And it turns out Douglas liked being on the pedestal. He didn't like being knocked off. And he, he sometimes threw mud back at his rivals, uh, uh, maybe worse than they threw it at him. Yeah. So. So he, he's very human. I think in the book, I call him all too human yeah. uh, at times. Uh, and his, his struggles also with holding together, uh, this, this is David, maybe what you were referring to about the family, his struggles to hold together an extended family that by the 1870s is, and 1880s is four adult children, 21 grandchildren, there had been two or three fictive siblings, former slaves who ha he had adopted or they adopted him, and always a variety of other hangers on that were around Douglas. And almost all of them were financially dependent on him. Mm -hmm. And this caused tremendous stress and pressure within that family. Uh, so, and again, there's the, the Evans collection was very helpful in trying to get to the bottom of some of that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, the, the more you find the foibles of some people that we call great, you know, in some ways, the greater they become because they just become so much more human, so much more multidimensional. Yeah. And Douglas doesn't fit into boxes, you know, he believed only this or he believed only that. He, he did not hold, you know, universally consistent positions throughout his life at all. You know, he was always in movement. He was always changing. He was almost never static. And he was always looking for the next idea that actually might be useful. I don't know if it's still uh, the top compliment, because I heard you say it maybe 
a year back or so, but you mentioned at least at that point, the, the best compliment you had had about the book is you were having breakfast, I believe, at a hotel and a woman came up to you and thanked you for making Anna, for humanizing her and making her part of the story. Uh, that, I thought that was really powerful, very touching. Well, one of the biggest enigmas about Douglas is trying to explain that 44 year marriage. Mm -hmm. Who was Anna? Well, nothing survives that Anna wrote. We do have three narratives. They're short, they're a dozen to 15 pages. Uh, written about her by three of the children, and those are priceless. One of those has always been available. It's called My Mother As I Recall Her by their daughter, Rosetta. And that was, uh, uh, she wrote that after both her parents had died, and it's a remarkable document. But in the Evans collection, there are two handwritten narratives by two of the sons, uh, by Charles and Frederick Jr., one of them is entitled Growing Up in the Douglas Household, and the other is called, uh, it's something like My Parents, uh, Frederick and Anna Douglas. Those two are priceless because you get insights into, particularly their mother, what Anna was like. And from those three narratives and from other things that people wrote in letters about Anna, you begin to realize this was a woman of rectitude, this was a very talented domestic woman. She was famous for her garden in Rochester, famous for her Maryland biscuits, famous for her, her pear orchards, orchards. And she ran a house. And Mr. D, we have to remember, was an itinerant orator and traveled all the time. I mean, I, I, I once started to try to calculate how much of his, of his uh, married life or his adult life, uh, that he was actually at home and how much not, and I, I couldn't really do it. But it's close to half of his life. He's not there. Uh, now, that doesn't mean he was abandoning his children. It means that's what he had to do to both make a living and, as he probably saw it, to change the world. Uh, but Anna ran that house. Anna raised those kids. And Anna raised grandkids. I mean, by the time they're living at Cedar Hill, that, that big near mansion house in Washington, D.C. in the late 1870s into the 80s, if you arrived, if you went to Cedar Hill on a given day, you'd, you'd see possibly most of the adult children, because a two, couple of them were living there or dropping by, and a whole slew of grandkids. <laughs> oh, and by the way, one of the grandchildren wrote a narrative. Actually, uh, yeah, it's kind of a diary turned into a narrative about being a granddaughter of Frederick Douglass. But there's a good deal in there, too, about her grandmother, Anna. Anna had rectitude. Anna didn't allow booze in her house. Anna hated social gatherings. Uh, just was not a public woman. Uh, so there are ways to get at her. But it's not easy. In fact, I've joked about this many times, uh, particularly with some of my friends who are Douglas scholars, that if we could ever get Douglas in a room and just sit him down, you know, and really have him for four hours of a seminar and he can't leave, you know, what are we going to ask him? My first question, I mean, I got a lot of questions. I got a whole list and he'll score them out of every one of them. But, but my first question would be, Mr. Douglas, Anna, discuss, <laughs> which you won't do, you know. Two words, pretty pungent, yeah. yeah. You know, and, then, and then I got a lot of others like, Mr. Douglas, <laughs> what did you really think of Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> then you yeah, so. created about three different varieties of Lincoln. I want to know what you really thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want, to, I want to come to that. Um, All right. But here's one thing that really is curious to me, and after reading your book, it's even more so. So as, as a party trick, if you went around to a party and said, okay, hey, who's the most photographed person in the 19th century? Yeah. Everyone's going to say Lincoln. I mean, just about yeah. everyone's going to say Lincoln, unless you have some scholar that's, uh, you know, like you or Ringer in there, but, but everyone's going to say Lincoln. Yeah, and you, don't want, you don't want those scholars at, a, at that party anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then you might have someone say, if you say, no, Lincoln's wrong, you might have someone say, 
okay, Mark Twain. Mark Twain's mm -hmm. the most wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then you go, no, you're wrong. It's, it's, it's Douglas. Yeah. And yeah. so, and then you've got him, as you mentioned, as traveled as Twain, if not more so because he went abroad and so did Twain. So you got this guy most photographed, traveled a heck of a lot. And yet I will tell you, maybe this tells you a lot for the circles I'm in. Hopefully you can um, not think it's too much of a freak that I've got this, but I, I've asked a lot of people, you know, certainly not only preparing for this, there's fortunately a lot of people on here who love Douglas and read about him deeply and read his autobiography. But I think the average American, and if I went throughout most suburban neighborhoods and said, tell me what you know about Frederick Douglass, they would stammer and go, I think he's important. Who is he? So it's amazing that we're talking the 19th century. We're not talking about the 13th century. We're talking about the 19th century. So pretty proximate to it. And then we're talking about the most photographed, most traveled person. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like in the popular milieu, he's not that well known. And his mm -hmm. autobiography, I know that a lot of high schools read it. Yeah. It still doesn't seem like it's dribbled down to society generally. So I'm curious why that is. I'm more perplexed by that than ever. Yeah, well, in my circles, it feels like Douglas is has really finally arrived. I mean, I'm amazed how many people are now interested in his story. However, you're quite right. Uh, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves that uh, uh, somewhat under 50% of Americans uh, go to college. Uh, so if they haven't encountered Douglas in high school, uh, they may never encounter him, except possibly in a documentary film if, if they watch them. Um, so it's, it's not that surprising to me, still not that widely known. However, uh, <laughs> you know, he's so much more widely known now than he was when I was young, for example. I learned nothing about Douglas in high school, and I was in high school in the 60s. I was a high school teacher in the 1970s, as we were just beginning to teach courses in black history. Uh, we, we, were, we were fumbling at it when most of us, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, but I was lucky enough to take the first ever black history course taught at Michigan State, which was where I was an undergrad, in either 1968 or 69, taught by Leslie Rout. And I think I encountered Douglas there, but I'm not sure. I must have. Um, but it was in the 70s that I first started learning anything about Douglas, excuse me, while I was teaching. In fact, I, I bought a poster that I still have up here in my house. It's an old one of these old posters you could buy from Scholastic or one of those supply companies for high school teachers. And the reason I've kept it as a keepsake is it has his wrong birth date and it has a middle initial. It's not his middle initial. So it's a keepsake. You know, it's like having a, a Mickey Mantle card with all the wrong statistics or something. Um, but, you know, even then in the 70s, Douglas was hardly known. Um, his narrative, the first autobiography, was out of print for about 100 years. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Back in print in 1960 wow. uh, by Harvard University Press, and it was introduced then by Benjamin Quarles, an African-American historian. And then there was another edition or two published in the late 60s, probably inspired by the civil rights movement. Then in the 70s, there was another edition. And I, I, I did my edition in um, actually 1990 or 91. Um, so, you know, it took a long time, but he is now a, a kind of canonized author, at yeah. least in college curriculums, and to some degree in high schools too. But still, as you suggest, if anybody knows anything about him, it might be, oh, he's that, he's that slave who became an abolitionist or mm -hmm. something, if that. Yeah. So, and that's not to cast any stones here. I mean, uh, we'd, we'd all like, in my business, we'd all like to think Americans get up every day and think, what can I learn about American history today? Although, given what the country's living through right now, it's remarkable how, how hungry people are for, for history so they can know where to put their feet right now to have some sense of, my God, how did we get here and where might we be going? Um, so, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, he wasn't a president of the United States. He never held elective office. He was black. He was a former slave. Uh, his writings for years and years and years, his writings were considered, well, he was a former slave. It can't be that important until people started to truly read them carefully. Yeah. Now Douglas, you know, is, is treated by every discipline. I was just, I keynoted a, a, a conference just last week held at the University of Richmond on Douglas. It was a day and a half. We did it all on Zoom. And it was amazing because we had scholars from law school, scholars in political philosophy, scholars in literature, uh, uh, of course, several historians. It came from various disciplines, all studying Douglas deeply, closely, particularly as a writer and a thinker. And uh, I had to tell them at the end of it just what a thrill that was to me. Because when I started out on Douglas in graduate school, I had classmates and they were, they were all smart, good people, they would say, I don't know, why do you want to write on Douglas? You know, uh, what agendas did he set? He never held office. He, he, he never really held a political position. Well, they'd never read him. <laughs> uh, and I landed on him because he had written so much. I figured there must be some story here I could tell. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. But you're always up against that with, with broad, public historical knowledge. It can be very depressing if you go out and really test broad historical knowledge among the American people. Jay Leno used to do it on his jaywalking. I don't know if you ever saw that, but it was- I did good. see it. I saw that some- That was a bit troubling. Yeah. You go out and ask people just on the street. <laughs> it's not fair. I mean- <laughs> Um, one thing that's striking, and I've got some witnesses here that can say, yeah, I know that about Dave, is that I have had a history, I'm 62, so I've had a history of, of struggling to work well within institutions where I perceive that leaders are either uh, lacking the guts to make the changes they need to make, uh, people are fearful of losing their jobs, you know, pragmatic realities. Um, I've always been, to use kind of a, a biblical metaphor, uh, more on the Elijah side, mm. of like Obadiah, his friend, who was hiding prophets on the slide, but still working, in essence, for Ahab. Mm -hmm. um, what's striking to me, and this is very much my autobiography, but I think there's some other people that can relate to this, is Douglas walked this incredible tightrope of being able to navigate within systems mm -hmm. and not be a, a crass pragmatist, still be a prophet, but he had realistic aims and yet he never lost sight of the bigger prophetic element. So that tethering of the pragmatic and the prophetic, I know very few people like that. I mean, I know some people that I feel like inclined to more the prophetic and will call out bad stuff and and they're they tend to be less in number than the pragmatists but um and i certainly know a lot of people within churches schools etc where i've worked that are just more that you know let's be realistic dave change is incremental i can't lose my job because i've got x amount of kids all these realities hmm. he navigated that in a way that you just you, you pick it up in the book and you just kind of scratch your head going, it's pretty remarkable. I know very few people like that. So could you address that? I mean, uh, well, Dave, that is an extraordinary insight. It really is because that captures probably a, it, it's a core, if not the core reason for Douglas's basic survival. Um, he came out of slavery full of rage. I don't know if there's any question about that. He was 20 years a slave, and he had experienced about every uh, brutality slavery could wreck, on a, particularly on a teenager. Uh, and yet, he had the lucky breaks, the good fortune, if you want to call it that, of gaining literacy when he was a child from his, uh, the woman who was married to one of his masters. Uh, and she taught him to read and write for a year and a half, and he picked it up. Then he had the good fortune of, of spending hours and hours and hours on Sundays uh, for probably two to three years with an old black preacher in Baltimore named Charles Lawson, uh, 
with whom he would read the old uh, the Bible, but particularly the Old Testament, he tells us, with Lawson, who, who wasn't a very good reader, but the kid was. So when he's like 13, 14, 15, he's sitting for hours just reading out loud, you know, <laughs> the Hebrew prophets. Who knows what he understood in Isaiah or Jeremiah or, for that matter, Genesis, good Lord. But it didn't matter. He got the King James language in his head. He got storytelling in his head. Then he tells us he attended four different kinds of churches in Baltimore, two of them pastored by white ministers, two by black. So two of them were essentially black churches. Two were white churches. He tells us what he liked about each of the ministers and didn't like and so on. He's only a teenager then. But he has a deep grounding in biblical story, at least, before he ever escapes from slavery when he's only 20. So to your point, he, you know, he's not prophetic at the moment. He escapes from slavery by any means. Uh, this, it takes a lot of practice, doesn't it? Uh, whatever, whatever a real prophet actually is at the end of the day, although I have a num numerous definitions I've borrowed from theologians in the book, as you know. Um, but he has that kind of grounding first in met bet biblical metaphor, biblical story, the wisdom of the Hebrew prophets, and, of course, the, the power, the sheer terrible power of the Exodus story, or, or, or for that matter, the creation story. Uh, or for that matter, just the voice of Jeremiah uh, wrecking, wrecking woe down upon his, his people. It's later that he has to learn politics, of course, uh, and, he do, and it takes time. He's first a moral suasionist while he's under the wing of William Lloyd Garrison. But politics is something he has to learn how to navigate because he, he, he comes to the realization that unless power could be affected, slavery would never die. Unless, unless their you know, party politics could be engineered against slavery, it would never be destroyed. Unless there were actual politicians, even if they didn't go far enough, who would at least put the future of slavery at risk, it would never be destroyed. He learns his pragmatism from experience, and it's, and it's scarring experience at times throughout the 1850s and into the Civil War. Um, and, you know, he's never satisfied very much with the politicians he has to make at times strange bedfellows with or allies with, uh, including Lincoln. Uh, but he learns he has to. And he learns that, that, again, if power cannot be truly affected no kind of great change can happen. And I think what he learned most as a radical abolitionist is that if they could not use politics and law to first damage and then ultimately destroy slavery, then the only option left was revolution. And a former slave knew better than non-former slaves that slave insurrection or rebellion or revolution, it, it just ended up in bloodbath. It just ended up in the death of the slaves. To Douglas, you had to find a way, if possible, to use politics. Otherwise, revolution was your only option. Yeah. And uh, that's, not, that's not a satisfying option. Yeah. I want to ask you a couple of questions about his Christianity. And before I do, I want to kind of put maybe a little bit more of a, uh, and please feel free to respond to this, but um, it, it's related, it seems like this pragmatism profit thing to what I would say in one sense, you get with Douglas, this incredible impatience. Mm -hmm. And yet because of his, as you say, his long view of history, mm -hmm. you get the almost the scholarly patient waiting. Mm -hmm. And again, a very unusual tethering of, kind of this feisty fighter kind of guy, but yet mm -hmm. because he's grounded in history, it's like, it's almost like you got a stallion who's being kind of trained to go, okay, wait a second, <laughs> keep yourself, you know, keep your wits about you a little bit. You got to navigate some big, yeah. issues. it just seemed like his self-awareness of that. I, I can't imagine what that was like, that churning inside at times for him. Yeah, I think at times he couldn't control it. 
but his advantage, and he says this quite explicitly many times, his great advantage here was his power with language. Mm -hmm. he, especially once he creates that newspaper, he not only then has oratory and you know an autobiography he can write, but he has a weekly newspaper for which he has to have something to say. You know, he, he was lucky enough that he could control the anger, the rage, the impatience, uh, the, the, the sheer sense of despair at times, uh, that you could ever end this system in America with the ability to write. He could go to his desk and write it down. We all understand that if, if, we've, if we've been writers at all, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I often don't know what I think about anything until I sit down to write. I mean, I think I, I, think I do in my head, but I really don't. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, he doesn't always control it. One quick example you may remember from the book. He goes to England for about 18 months, 1845 to 47, right after he publishes the narrative. And he has this extraordinary flowering experience. He is embraced by the Irish, the Scottish, and the British anti-slavery movements. He is treated like a conquering hero, sometimes like a rather exotic, you know, black or brown hero, but nevertheless, and he makes many close associations, friendships. A group of them buy his freedom for him. He is treated truly like a human being and even a heroic human being. But, but when he comes back in the spring of 1847, and he actually had considered briefly, at least not never coming back and trying to get his family over to England, but that wasn't a real option. But when he comes back to America, spring of 1847, and he immediately goes on, out on the road as a speaker, he is suddenly this raging, angry young black man. He's only 28, 29 by then. And he's back into the hothouse of American racism. It's in the midst of the Mexican War. It's, you know, the fugitive slave crisis is emerging. It's going to culminate in the Compromise of 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Act. And when he first goes out on the road speaking, he, he uses a refrain in, in his speeches at first where he says, my country hates me and I hate it back. I have no country. I have no patriotism. I would wish its constitution shattered into a thousand pieces. And at one point, Wendell Phillips, the great abolitionist, one of the Garrisonians, took him aside. I have this little letter. Well, it's a letter, but I have, I have the impression he must have taken him aside and said, Fred, tone it down. I mean, you're, you're going crazy here. You're going to lose the audience. And he did not tone it down. Uh, although he was learning to navigate different kinds of audiences. Uh, he just was no longer as willing to accept you know, being Jim Crow, uh, encountering the kinds of racism that he would now encounter on trains, in cities, uh, in various northern cities. Um, but he's learning that he has to find a way to contain the rage into some kind of useful persuasion. Otherwise, he might fly apart. You think his humor helps him in that regard to kind of buff it a bit? Oh, no question. Uh, whether, whether it was just in telling a joke, but more importantly, I think it was even in his performance style. Mm -hmm. uh, his most prominent speech early uh, out on the anti-slavery circuit was one that they came to call the slaveholder's sermon. And he would get up and mim he would perform as a Southern white preacher, he'd go to those passages in the Bible, slaves be loyal, and he'd go into Southern accents, slaves be loyal to your masters, and on and on and on, he'd go and he'd prance all over the stage, he'd carry a Bible with him and hold it up, and he'd have audiences laughing and crying and shouting for more. He also could use humor, especially as he got older, when he encountered racism. I mean, when he would be denied a meal in a, in a restaurant or a, a room in, a, in, a, in an inn or literally told to get off the steamboat or off the car on a train, he would sometimes, and not at first, at first he would fight back. But as time went on, he, he learned sometimes to try to use humor to embarrass the person who's trying to Jim Crow him. And he could sometimes get, get all the white people <laughs> A restaurant on his side. He once went into a restaurant, this was after the war, and I have this because it ended up in a newspaper. 
and uh, uh, the the proprietor says, "Sir, I can't serve you in the dining room here. I just can't do that. Uh, we don't serve your kind." He said, "You'll have to eat in the kitchen." And so <laughs> Douglas stood up in front of all the other diners, who were all white, and said, "Where do you feed your dogs? Take me where you feed your dogs. I'll eat with your dogs, sir." And suddenly the people in the restaurant are all standing up and saying, oh, let that poor man eat here, you know. So sometimes that kind of humor would work. Sometimes it probably didn't. But he did have um, not only a sense of humor, but a deep and abiding sense of irony. Uh, irony was sort of his favorite mode. Um, and I think to survive, almost anybody needs a sense of irony. Let me ask you the earliest question I received uh, from a friend, long, long time friend was, uh, and I might put a little bit of a gloss on her question, but I think the gist of it is, what kind of parallels do you see, if any, in the way the church acted in the 19th century? And when I say the church, I'm going to give you kind of the broad Christian church of the 19th century of which he was you know, having some kind of uh, interaction with uh, the church of his day versus the church today when it comes to social justice. How, how would you see parallels, distinctions between how well the church is? What would Douglas think, in the essence, if we could beam him into churches today and how he was back then? Well, first of all, we should understand that this man was a Protestant. Uh, and there are many ways you ultimately find that out from him. Uh, it comes out, and this is another uh, of his warts, Dave. Uh, he could at times be rather anti-Catholic, mm -hmm. and he expressed it, um, especially in private. But he was a Protestant. He was raised in Methodism. He went to Methodist camp meetings when he was a slave teenager with his, with his owner. Uh, he hated the religious hypocrisy of the Methodists, but he, he nevertheless was imbued with Methodism in many ways. Uh, so that's where his religious uh, practice and his uh, worldview and his outlook originally came from. Um, but he encountered two kinds of churches, if you like. First was the brutally, to him, brutally contradictory and hypocritical Southern Protestants who were slaveholders and Christians. Uh, he makes so much, if you, if you read the first autobiography, even more of it in the second autobiography, he makes so much of watching his master, Thomas Auld, at the camp meeting, going into the circle and weeping as he makes his confessions. And, and what, a, what a faithful believer, he says, Thomas Auld was. And then they went back home. And on Tuesday, Ald was beating on one of the slaves, you know, and then Douglas would exploit that to show this, again, brutal hypocrisy. Um, and the hypocrisy of the church was one of his favorite subjects. It always was. On the other hand, among the Garrisonian abolitionists uh, and others, it didn't have to be Garrisonians, he actually encountered well-churched people uh, who were genuinely anti-slavery. Uh, now, he's going to have a lot of problems with Garrison. He's going to have a terrible breakup with Garrison in the early 1850s and so on. And he encountered a good deal of racism from some abolitionists. But he also made very dear friendships with many of these people. And the heart of his friendships with many of them was the realization that these were people of faith who uh, believed what they preached, uh, could, could talk the talk and walk the walk, uh, many of whom put their lives on the line uh, with him out on the circuit uh, as anti-slavery itinerant lecturers. At times, they even defended him physically. He gave great credit to a man named, I hope I'm getting the first name, William White. Douglas got into a, a mob attacked their anti-slavery outdoor a gathering in Indiana in 1843, summer of 1843, Pendleton, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a brutal mob. I mean, they came with, with bats and stones and chairs, and they were just tearing the place up and beating everybody up. 
Douglas got into the melee with him. He broke his wrist. But this guy, William White, according to Douglas, pulled Douglas out of this mob, got him into the back of a wagon, and hurried him out of there, or he'd have been killed. Yeah. And all through his life, he gave William White credit for saving his life. So he encountered two kinds of churches uh, in that sense. The Protestantism, though, was, uh, you know, was part of his temperament. He was a, and it, this is interesting to me, and I never, I never felt like I fully figured this out either. Uh, he was a great follower and a, an admirer of uh, the Apostle Paul. And it may have had something to do with the fact that Paul was, you know, the prisoner apostle, that he was in, in prison by the Romans. But when he goes on a tour of Europe in 1886 with his second wife, Helen, they go for 11 months, starting in Ireland and England and then over to France and down to Italy. And then eventually they extended their tour all over the Mediterranean. They went to Egypt, they went to um, Athens. And Douglas, in, he kept a diary, thank God. He didn't keep it every day. I wish he had, because it's an amazing diary. Um, he started just saying things about the Catholic Church that are really quite ugly. <laughs> he would say, my God, and he's just overwhelmed by the architecture. He just, he's just overwhelmed. First in Paris, well, he saw cathedrals in England too, but my God, they get into the south of France and then into Italy. And he's just nuts over the architecture. But he says, how could people of such genius build buildings like this and yet still believe in priesthood and popery, you know, and, uh, in, in, in the very language of anti-Catholicism. And it's kind of ugly. <laughs> but then, then he says in his diary, I just saw Naples, you know, and Naples is one of the most beautiful places a human being can ever see. But all I really want to see are here on the coast of Italy is where Paul came ashore. Yeah, he had this the story of Paul to him was so motivating. And even when they're crossing the Mediterranean, he writes in his diary that they can see lanterns on uh, Cyprus. And he says, I wonder if Paul saw any lights on Cyprus when he was being taken the other way to prison by the Romans, that sort of thing. Yeah. And even in Athens, what does he do? He goes out to that, uh, that, that huge hill that's near the Acropolis. I have a photo of it in the book and I'm blocking the name of it now, but it's where Paul gave his uh, sermon to the, to, the, to the Greek skeptics. And that's still, yeah. He went out and he tells us, got out his Bible and read Paul's yeah. you know, story. So he had, he had an attachment to, uh, well, first of all, he had an attachment to the Hebrew prophets, but he had an attachment to Paul as well. So his connections with the church are complicated. Mm. All I'll say other than that is that as he got older and older, of course, his faith, no question, diminished. Mm. Uh, and he became quite skeptical. Uh, but he never stopped using biblical language, biblical story, using the prophets. Uh, he still, to his dying day, couldn't, couldn't write a speech without some kind of biblical passage as part of his storytelling. Um, and how, it's, I want to be sensitive to your time. We're coming up to the top of the hour. I mean, I got literally hours more of question. I know that's not what we're going to do, but you have a few more minutes? I can. Sure, sure. Them? Okay, great. Um, it's curious to me, and it, and it struck me, when I first read his autobiography years ago, uh, as he mentions how some of the most glibly quoting masters were the most glibly quoting the Bible masters were the most, some of them were the most brutal mm -hmm. as far as the way they'd whip their, their slaves. Yeah. So it's amazing that he experienced some of that firsthand himself, obviously with all the, and, and all that, and yet, and saw this just rank hypocrisy. And I'm, I'm working on a documentary on those who are disillusioned with the church and called Duns is the, the mm. kind of technical sociological category for them if you run into it. And yeah. a lot of them are just tired and, and just fed up with that kind of hypocrisy. 
most of us, at least white Americans, have not seen anything like or experienced anything like the rank hypocrisy that, that he has uh, or he did. Um, it's amazing he stayed within the orbit of Christianity after that. Is that, uh, you think, to some degree a pragmatic thing and that he said, hey, the language of Scripture is really serviceable because I'm dealing with a so-called in a very broad sense, a Christian saturated Protestant country, mm -hmm. this will help me get some traction as far as persuasion. Or, or, well, or, I don't think it ever became purely strategic okay. for Doug, using, you know, biblical story or prophetic language. I don't think it was ever just purely strategic for him uh, because it was so long practiced, uh, so deep in his bones. Uh, it, was, it was a fire in his bones that he couldn't get out. Um, now, it is the 19th century. It's a Christian country. Uh, it's, its civil religion is deeply, you know, enlisted in its, in its uh, you know, theological religion. Um, he's a believer without a question in this kind of providential view of history, this idea that uh, God sometimes, or divine power sometimes, just enters history and might even tear it up and make it over again. Uh, he really did, you know, uh, uh, make the analogy between the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the destruction of the United States in order for it to ever be renewed. Um, he was absolutely steeped in that kind of uh, worldview. Um, now, we d we can tell that um, his faith undergoes a lot of change in the latter part of his life, and there were some influences on that. Uh, this German woman named Otilia Assing being one of them, although her influence I don't think was ever so high as she thought it was, uh, and the only sources we have about that relationship are her sources. Um, but, you know, he still remained, when he moves to Washington, um, he remained, he became a member of the Metropolitan AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Washington. He, he, uh, he kept a pew there. Uh, they will still show you his pew there. Uh, he, uh, he could use, he spoke in so many American churches, you could never even count them. If there was an AME church in a town or a city, Douglas spoke there. Uh, his, his primary place that he would speak on a regular basis in Rochester, what's called the Spring Street AME Church. He gave a whole lecture series there. He could have that pulpit anytime he wanted it. He would do the lecture series on Sunday afternoons. He would take a subject, a topic, and he'd do six weeks on a topic. Um, you know, uh, so he, he had so much experience uh, in churches that, that he could never not be connected to that. Plus, this is a man with no formal education, none, not a day of his life in a school. And yet he is utterly uh, devoted to two traditions um, that he has to learn essentially on his own. And one is the Bible and the other is the Enlightenment. You know, he has a secular tradition and a, and a, and a theological tradition which is very common in the 19th century. This is just, Lincoln was the same way although Lincoln was much less churched. Um, so Douglas, Douglas could love the Declaration of Independence. He could love a Thomas Paine. Um, at the same time, he could, he could almost not function without Jeremiah and Isaiah. So, I mean, this is the world he came from. Um, how he sustained a personal faith in, in, in God uh, is not... I, in the end, I had to simply say, it's not discernible. Yeah. And to me, it was less important over time than it was how he used uh, biblical traditions and biblical story, and especially uh, the, the Hebrew prophets. Mm -hmm. And very, the very idea of prophetic language. He never once called himself a prophet, which I was grateful for. Mm -hmm. And, and as you may know from hearing me speak somewhere else, 
one of the biggest dilemmas I had in this book was was dealing with him theologically because I have no formal theology training, but I have some. But I've read a lot of theology, and I have some good friends who are theologians, and they got me reading people like Walter Brueggemann on the Old Testament and Robert Alter on the King James language, and especially Abraham Heschel. Yeah. On uh, what what a prophet actually is, and they helped me understand. Oh yes, Douglas was a prophet, um, and, and he was that rarest of people who could find ways to use language to explain those things in our lives that the rest of us can't explain. Yeah. Well, uh, Dave Mahan, who uh, you just connected with at the beginning of this Zoom, is there at Yale. Mm -hmm. his PhD at Cambridge on theology and poetry. So you know, oh. some conversations, there's a bunch of guys there at the Rivendell Institute that uh, I really respect a lot. And, and you can have some good coffees there. Uh, I'll try. Oh, to I'd love to. Let's do a seminar together. And I can, I wish I'd known about you guys five years ago, four years ago. Yeah, it would have been good. Mm -hmm. We share, I know, an appreciation, you and I, for the writings of Andrew Del Banco at Columbia. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. One thing he said, and I'm curious, I know sometimes when people put things in shorthand, it's not as maybe nuanced as they maybe even would like it to be, but he has famously said that prior to the Civil War, Americans generally believed in the providence of God, that God was involved. Mm -hmm. The war was so catastrophic and so far reaching yeah. and so devastating and so just busted every possible, uh, you know, thing that people thought would ever happen that after the war, they believed, according to Dobanka, more in luck than Providence. Is that, yeah. a, is that a serviceable shorthand, do you think, for how cataclysmic the, the Civil War was? Yeah, I liked I like Andy's book. You're referring to the book called "The Death of Satan," I think. That's a that's a heck of a book. Yeah, uh, yeah I think he's basically right about that. At least in the short term, um, the war the war was utterly overwhelming. I mean, we 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 have you almost have to look at some numbers to understand that. Uh, if the number of Americans that died in the Civil War, which is slightly over seven hundred thousand, per capita are moved to the Vietnam era, there would be about five and a half million names on the Vietnam Memorial per capita. That's, that's the level of devastation the Civil War wrecked on American society, North and South, white and black. The American uh, population at the time, I think you read it's about 30 million, so that's about a- Yeah, 30, 35 million. Yeah. And, uh, it affected everybody. Yeah. It uh, it destroyed families. Uh, the destruction of the South, of course, was far more profound than it was for the North. But it and and there now have been a couple of terrific books, uh, especially by Drew Faust, on the problem of death in the Civil War, the reckoning with death. Republican. I wrote about this a uh, good deal in my book called Race and Reunion, the book on Civil War memory. Um, it was a society that now had to find a way to explain how this could have ever happened, how this scale of loss uh, had, had really ever happened. Um, and that has a lot to do with the way Civil War memory played out over time and a lot to do with the ways in which uh, racial justice got buried in the need and desire for sectional reconciliation. Um, but yeah, it uh, and Douglas, you know, one of the things about Douglas is he wanted that war. I have a whole chapter in the book, as you may remember, on Douglas as a war propagandist. Uh, and he became a vicious, thumping war propagandist once the war came, once it broke out. He was unleashed now uh, to wreck rhetorical hell on the South, on slaveholders, on, on white Southerners, and God, did he do it. Um, he was now able, in a sanctioned war, to, to express his hatred. And that's what it is. He's creating the horrible Hun in 1861 and 62 and into 63. 
So this was not a war and and a scale of slaughter that Douglas ever regretted. You, you'll look in vain to find regret. I mean, he can he speaks in tragic terms. He had a deep sense of what I would call authentic tragedy, but he never regretted that war. He saw it as the necessary Armageddon. Um, again, in biblical terms, it must it must be it mu it has to happen. Um, whether it's by divine dictate or or by the the sheer scale of the evil of this system um, in order for this country to ever be remade. But he, at the same time, he was a patriot. He was a radical patriot. He was a believer in America's creeds. He was above all else a believer in the natural rights tradition is really what sustained him. This idea that the basic rights, the basic liberties, uh, however you want to call them, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, or uh, you can call them other things, which he even included the right to vote. Um, they were natural to him. He once compared the natural rights to, to uh, like precious ore from the earth. They belonged to everybody. Um, so he could, he, 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 he never regretted that war. And he was always uh, an, uh, an unfailing patriot, even in the face sometimes of just sheer despair. He would not, even his famous speech on lynching at the very end of his life, he first writes it in 1893, and he's still giving that speech up until about three months before he died. He even ends that speech, which is a three-part uh, bitter analysis of why lynching was happening. He even ends that speech on a, on a hope drawn from the natural rights tradition. Um, he's, he, he never used the phrase, you know, the arc of history bends toward justice. That came from Theodore Parker, which is where Martin Luther King picked it up. Um, he never used that one. I'm glad he didn't because I don't really believe it. <laughs> uh, but, but he a lot really- of that would flow from that comment for me, but go ahead. I know, I know, I know. But, but <laughs> Douglas always, it was, it was as though Douglas believed he had a responsibility to always find some way to end on hope. It was like he carried this as a burden. Um, and he usually did, although there were two or three instances in his life when he really couldn't do it. Sometimes he would end, uh, I think it's from the book of Matthew, you'll correct me. Uh, I walk by faith and not by sight. He would use, the, he would he would try to manufacture some hope and then he would say, but I walk by faith, not by sight. <laughs> yeah. What, um, you know, I, let me just wrap this up with a couple other questions that as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, okay, he's unique. He's a unique person. Um, unusual set of strengths as we've talked about. And I was kind of combing my memory banks and I stay up with these sort of things quite a bit. So I'm thinking, okay, who are the 20th century politicians, either side of the aisle, that reflect a lot of the greatness of Douglas. The two first names I came up with, you might disagree with these, but the names I came up with, because I want to be fair to both big parties, Daniel Patrick Moyn Moynihan on, on one side, and maybe mm -hmm. Jack Kemp to a much lesser degree on the other side, who seem huh. to be able to work within a system, but yet be prophetic and push back to their own party. Yeah. Um, wow, Moynihan, that's an interesting choice. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell would be proud. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, some of my friends are going, wait, Lawrence O'Donnell's on MSNBC. Dave watches MSNBC? Anyway, I'm just kidding. Well, well Lawrence, <laughs> wasn't Lawrence his uh, chief of staff, I think, for years? Yeah. For Moynihan? Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, well, you, you're talking about, you know, high elected officials here. Yes. Uh, and you said Jack Kemp is the other? I said Jack Kemp to a lesser degree just because I'm trying to think of people yeah. that then can tether that working in their system. And yeah. Jack Kemp was a committed Republican, but yet he was willing to push back on things about what were going on that he yeah. thought were really unjust and some of the cruelty of capitalism. He yeah. was really out there in the Reagan era kind of, winsomely but he was he was making yeah. things pretty clear that a lot of republicans felt a bit uncomfortable with. i think he's much lamented now especially he there, there was a moral core to yeah. jack kemp uh uh and 
possibly his football life had helped, had affected that. He played with a, a great number of black athletes uh, throughout his career. Uh, I don't know for sure, because uh, I don't know his biography that well. Um, yeah, I mean, there are other uh, elected officials that probably, I mean, Obama has to be considered in this as well. Obama made himself in some ways into a great reader. And, uh, and in a lot of Obama's speeches, he does channel Douglas. I know he does. Um, uh, well, you know, and, and a lot of other people as well. Um, but on the Republican side, I don't know. I mean, back in the Back in the 60s, there were still, you know, sort of party of Lincoln Republicans around. Um, I wouldn't say Nelson Rockefeller necessarily fits this. Um, but th those who at least could claim to be Rockefeller Republicans, who today would be moderate Democrats, I mean, or perhaps centrist Democrats, I guess. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 hard to just nail down uh, a particular, I don't know, a Henry Wallace maybe, mm. uh, as someone who, whether you're talking about labor or you're talking about race, was really re representative of traditions in high office from the old abolition movement. Um, so, you know, and, and maybe Bobby Kennedy, particularly if he had, you know, if he had lived out uh, in any kind of uh, full career, uh, given what the 60s was doing to our politics and probably doing to him. Uh, uh, I mean, his campaign in 1868, at least the potential that it had showed, shown, uh, was, was a remarkable coalition uh, had, he, had he survived. Now, you know, but you're right, it's hard to find uh, the elected officials because they're elected, because they have to, they have to deal with reality. They have to, um, I do think the, the Democratic Party now, uh, given all the new kinds of young people, particularly a lot of women who come into the Democratic Party are drawing upon, whether they're fully aware of it or not, are drawing upon not only uh, the feminist movement and some of the, some of the 60s civil rights, um, uh, ideology, but they're they're drawing on on the old abolitionist as well, uh, in ways they may not even fully be aware of, uh, and they're getting elected. You know, they're getting elected to Congress. Uh, whether they can sustain a coalition, you know, that can actually uh, develop policy uh, that can win and hold power is is the question. One of the things Douglas learned, this is back to your point on pragmatism, that successful politics is always about coalition. Yeah. He learned that. Yeah. And that was not easy to do as a radical abolitionist. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, uh, as we wrap up here, let me just say to those of you guys who are here, uh, after we say goodbye to Dr. Blight, uh, I'm going to stay on for a while. So if you want to debrief, chat, whatever, uh, that would be great. Uh, I know there's a movie that possibly may be in the works with the Obama's company on, based on your book. Yeah. My advice is you don't help them out too much because you don't want the movie to be better than your book. So <laughs> just give them some material, but kind of pull your punches a little bit. Okay. It's a free, free advice. Du duly heard. But I have to say that's at the moment, not my worry. Uh, the movie business, as you may know, is a very complex and messy business. Mm. Uh, I went with the Obama's company called Higher Ground because they are a very small, tight, smart bunch of people. It's just two producers that run that company. Um, and I really liked her, them. Um, we're now struggling with the second screenwriter. The first screenwriter was uh, uh, dismissed. Not by me, but by the producers. We're now working with a second screenwriter that I probably can't announce. And he has produced a treatment. And I'll just say uh, it's, it's, it's undergoing revision and uh, a screenplay is to come out of it. It's going to be a single feature film for Netflix, if it happens. 
but I've been around this corner for almost 20 years with different filmmakers and different screenwriters about a film on Douglas. So I don't, uh, I don't hold my breath. That's a crazy business. Yeah. For every screenplay that gets written, uh, for every 10 screenplays that get written, barely one ever gets made. So we'll see. Don't hold your breath, but okay. <laughs> it's a good company. It, yeah. and, the, and the Obamas want the film made. Yeah. And if nothing else, I got to meet Obama for an hour and a half, and we had a little oh. seminar on Douglas. Yeah. That was fun. Well, that's neat. Well, thanks very much for your time. <coughs> I will connect you with Dave Mahan and really. Sure, thank you. Graciousness, your book is just fabulous, and, and I can't speak too highly about it, and terrific job. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you all for coming tonight on a Friday night. Yeah. I really appreciate it, and uh, have a good evening, everybody, and stay healthy out there. Thank you. Take care.